This is SciBite, episode 135, for July 8th, 2014. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast live on a Tuesday and fresh on a Wednesday over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. So uh, what are we going to talk about today? Today, we're going to take a look at adding and subtracting exoplanets, diabetes research, spacecraft updates, viewer feedback, curiosity news, and as always, take a peek back in history and up in the sky this week. I think I heard you say planet math, so let's kick it off with the news. Okay, Heather, what is our first news story today? At the controversial existence of two possible planets located in the habitable zone of a star have kind of had a final ending to their story. Oh, okay. So a long, long time ago, in a Jupiter broadcasting far, far away, okay. there was a Jupiter at Night episode <laughs> talking <laughs> about <laughs> an exoplanet that there was, it was this big news. The system had, um, they you know talked about planets being in this exoplanet system in 2007. And then suddenly in 2010, they said, hey, we think there are some Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone, which at that point was really big news. Because it was, you know, among the first, closest to Earth size. And then one of the scientists involved changed the whole thing. Uh Uh-oh. Quoting, saying, essentially, since life is everywhere that it likes to be, I give it a 100% chance, no doubt about it, life is there. Whoa. Yeah, by the way, scientists saying 100% chance. <laughs> not so scientific. Not the greatest idea. <laughs> not ex- that's not 100% scientific when you do that, Heather. No. <laughs> um, so, of course, the media jumps all over it, loads of headlines, uh, you, know, con- you know, drawings and pictures of concepts of alien worlds come Ooh. up, and Jupiter at Night episode pops up. Of course. I remember this, and I was like, I remember us covering this. Something happened. It was Jupiter at Night. And so then this whole thing. So what happened is these, this you know team of scientists said, hey, we discovered it. This is awesome. Is it around this dwarf star? And then two weeks later, another team said, where? We can't find those. Another two years, two years later, another team said, you know, they'd anal- they did analysis on some extended data set and said, well, we do see it. And then there was a press release at the same time from this planetary habitability lab saying, um, yeah, this is going to keep being controversial, everybody. Let's, let's, let's uh, keep looking at it. <laughs> wow, it's not too often, though, that when we're talking about a story, I can go to one of our own episodes and actually cite the video to get visuals for the story we're talking about now. Yes, cite the, the, the old episode where we had visuals where we had cited visuals elsewhere. Yes, of course. <laughs> it's sort of a meta sighting, if you will. Yes, it is. It's fun and awesome. But as of now, those two planets have been officially crossed off the list. Okay. Little X's through it. Um, it looks like they were actually some false data signals coming out of the star's activity and rotation. Now, because I mean... Let's face it, we're looking at exoplanets orbiting around stars very far away. Right. And this was all the way back in 2010. I mean, that seems like, what do you mean all the way back? Science is coming, going very far, very fast, and us being able to detect these tiny little blips in stars, in starlight, saying, a little bit of a dip, hey, there's a planet there. There may be something there. Now we're going to take the Earth bound telescopes and look at it and look for tiny little wobbles in the star's light to say, yes, the star is wobbling just a little bit. There's some sort of mass there to make to make it move. And there's all these different things that have to go on for us to be able to identify or sort of say, yes, we do believe there's something there hmm. to, you know, belay the uncertainty. 
So every now and then, there's a little funky data in the data. Yeah, there's a little funky data in the data. So now they're thinking, well, there was something going on. Maybe there was a little bit of debris or, you know, maybe some big um, event on the star itself. Was there, you know, a lot of just some sort of, you know, stuff in the solar system that was orbiting it that just happened to catch it a few times? Yeah. Or was there some big... Um, you know, sun, essentially sunspot type things or something on the star itself that would have disrupted the signal just a little bit, rotated on the star a few times. Uh, I mean, this was planets that were close enough that they were orbiting quick enough that that could be reasonable-ish, that it could have been on the surface. So anyway, there was some sort of blip in the data there. Now they have officially said, no, there were not stars there. Um there are still three other planets that exist around that star. They're not saying there are no planets around that one. They're just saying there's not four lights. There are only three lights. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Actually, in actuality, yes. Okay. We're not just trying to convince ourselves. All right. All right. Well, very good. That's a fascinating. And and talk about a, a long-term follow-up. Well, we covered that first first time we covered that was in 2010. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what's, what's sad is I started to read this and I was like, I think I remember hearing about this somewhere on Jupiter. Nice. I started looking back and I'm like, oh my goodness. Very nice. Well, I'm glad we could be a resource now. Why don't uh, we take a moment and talk about a way the audience can help us keep that resource going. Go over to patreon.com slash today. This is our crowdfunding effort for the network. We have a lot of plans we want to do. Uh, perhaps maybe even hire some staff and, uh, of course, upgrade some equipment and keep things going. And we want to do that in a way that we can do with some amount of predictability, some amount of estimating without having to do too many commercials, without having to double down on sponsorships. Why not have our audience be the source of our funding because they're the ones directly consuming the content? And if you think about the way more traditional artisan media used to be done, this model makes a lot of sense back then. And I think it makes a lot of, a lot of sense today with platforms like Patreon. Patreon is a payment system. They manage the payment processing so that way it's cheaper for Jupiter Broadcasting because they take advantage of batch processing. They integrate things like PayPal or your debit card. And they're going to interview they're they're working at integrating Bitcoin. We'll actually see if they eventually manage to do that. And it, where, the way it works is it's a monthly pledge. You go over there and pledge any amount you're comfortable with. I have a default of $3 a month. And that helps support all of our shows. But we also have other pledge levels to give you an idea of what your contribution goes to, including exclusive clay, uh, swag it's an exclusive swag club for certain pledge levels. And then we have different milestones we're trying to get. We're trying to get to our next big milestone. We've coined it the barbecue challenge because that's how we're going to celebrate when we get there. But that's just a spot where we, once we know we have that level of monthly funding, we're able to budget for certain things and uh, make a, a couple of really important moves that I, I don't know if I want to really publicly talk about yet, but you guys will definitely know it's for the better. And so you can help us get there by going over to patreon.com slash today and give any amount you're comfortable with. It's just once per month, and it helps keep us on the air. And we really appreciate it. Patreon.com slash today. All right, Heather, it's time for the News Bite. Okay, what are we talking about in the News Bite? Investigators over at the University of Cincinnati have actually found a therapy that may reverse new onset type 1 diabetes. They are doing it in mouse models. And it could advance the efforts in combating the disease among humans itself. Wow. So type 1 diabetes is uh, where the body does not produce sufficient insulin, which is very essential to glucose metabolism. Without insulin, blood glucose rises. It's usually diagnosed in children and young adults. Affects about 5% of all people with diabetes. There is no cure. It can only be controlled with insulin therapy. Now, in it, What's happening is uh, there's an autoimmune autoimmunity that's causing the body to actually to attack the insulin producing cells. Now, in the end, for the immune system, there's kind of two parts to the immune system. Uh, one that we are born with and attempts to fight infections just straight away. And, in, and the adaptive, which kind of takes some time to kind of mount a response. It's more specific. Mm. Um, so what we're looking at is the innate, the one that we kind of come with, sends, mes sends messages to that adaptive one. So they kind of talk to each other a little bit. And we've seen that, you know, some of that has to do with um, 
non-obese diabetic mice with talking to immune cells and partially due to defects. So we're seeing some of this immune system in the past. So they're using that to build upon it and saying, all right, well, by using a specific antibody to stimulate a molecule, they can actually, re in the immune system, they can actually reverse with a really high success rate um, new onset diabetes in mice that have already started to develop these symptoms. What they're kind of doing is they are kind of stopping the immune system kind of before it starts um, or early in its process. Hmm. So it's like it's just now starting to attack the um, – it's starting to go and attack the attack the stuff. So you have – now general – so what they're doing is they're going through and they're saying, all right, well, it, there's, there's two ways to, attack, to initiate the, to kind of combat the immune system. Okay. And they're kind of going at it in a different way in this specific fashion. To try to head it off in a sense or catch it yeah, before they're a certain stage? Yeah, they're trying to catch, exactly. So what they're doing is kind of preserving the attack uh, so they're combating it through um, not directly interacting with the t-cells themselves but sort of suppressing mm -hmm. the immune response itself so some of time most of the time they're sort of interacting with uh, the parts that are being attacked so they're trying that's what a lot of research is going towards and in this case they're trying to quiet down the overzealous part of the immune system. Interesting. So, I mean, the key to this in this specific uh, development is catching the disease at its onset. Now, in mice, that's a very short window of time. But in humans, you have, um, that's a much longer window. But it's similar in that you would have to catch it in that starting process. But because it's, the process itself in the startup is similar, fairly similar, that it's not that unreasonable to say what works in mice would work in humans. It's, it's interesting. How, okay, so the, the uh, starting, the catching it while the disease is early in its process being so critical, now that's a big gap. Like that's, that means that probably only people that have really good access to preventative care will be the most likely to benefit. But... We're seeing a lot of movement around health technology that's constantly monitoring things like your glucose le levels or your calories or your cholesterol or whatever. Like it's const all these little medical devices that people can wear in their bodies, on their bodies, that are giving them a constant data stream of information means that that technology will come down in price as that becomes more widespread. More people have access to information like that that will then kind of get a heads up when it's, you know, at that yeah, stage it, where they can still take uh, advantage of something like this. Yeah, and the window does include the start of um, the symptoms. So you can start to see symptoms of everything, and that is, that is in the window. So you start to see symptoms. Can you go in? Can you get checked out? You know, is it like you said? And then can you start this type of therapy? Now, what is really on the good side is that um, if it does actually work in humans, which they think it probably will. Yeah that there are some drugs that are very similar to this, that work in a similar fashion, that have already been approved or are under development to be approved by the FDA. Well, isn't that handy? So it's, it has a much higher chance of going through successfully and more quickly. There you go. That's good news. And good for those companies, too. Win-win, Heather. Uh, any yes. other thoughts on that? Uh, no, just looking forward to as we can combat these type of things better and better. All right, then uh, let me. Hey, hey, guys, come on in here. Guess what? Yeah, come on. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. All right, Heather, what are we talking about in the two byte news? All right, everyone might be a little sad with the first story how we're getting rid of some exoplanets. But we are adding some exoplanets. Boom. We do potentially, air quotes, <laughs> habitable Earth-like planet only 16 light years away has been discovered. 
Now, this one was discovered by the gravitational pull on its parent star, which, you know, as we've talked about before, kind of causes a star to wobble just slightly if there's a, a planet there, because that means there's a little bit of a mass pulling it this way and that way. Now, they previously found um, this same team, a cold uh, Jupiter-like planet in a near circular orbit uh, that was about nine years long. Now, this one is one another one of those uh, super Earth planets. That's fairly close. It takes 16 days to orbit this red dwarf star. It's about five times the mass of Earth. But the thing is, it seems like that might be really close, but because of the type of star it is, it has a um, red dwarf star spits out a lot less energy than our sun. Right. So on the surface, it's getting about the same amount of energy that Earth does because it shines much more dimly. It has a much cooler temperature, mm -hmm. uh, the star does. So... Among the characteristics of what they put, um, you know, Earth-like planets, what they call have a what they call a Earth Similarity Index. What uh, some, a team of scientists at the University of Puerto Rico, at the Arecibo Telescope, they have it amongst the top three Earth-like planets. So it's amongst the top now. Of you know, it's in the same kind of has the same energy level you know getting to the planet surface of the planet so it's not out of the realm of possibilities that something might be squirming there so you're saying it's an m-class planet and as mr spock would say much like your earth possibly it could be I've, right i mean there could be yes. an oceans on there with uh, fishy swimming in there possibly we're going to be careful and not be like other scientists and say, there's not a 100% chance yeah. of anything. <laughs> there's not. Now, if the planet had a similar atmosphere to Earth, giant, bold, italicized, underscored, if. Right. Um, if it had one that would give a possibility to life, um, seasonal shifts would be very extreme. Oh. But because of the mass of the planet, if it ever had an atmosphere it would still be there, but it would make it inhospitable because the dense atmosphere would trap the heat. Essentially, it would make it a super Venus. Oh, so you're saying so it would be kind of like my studio right now? Yeah, it would make it more like the studio. Okay, okay. So it's M-class-like, but depending upon the atmosphere, yeah. then it goes towards studio class, which is not quite as happy. Not not habitable. No, you, can, you can't survive in that. No, no. Yeah. That's why you got to have an underwater dome where you have a fortress and an army of underwater sea people. I see. And that somehow makes things cooler. Uh, you ready for a spacecraft update, Heather? Let's go. All right. What are we talking about? Opportunity Rover, our great little rover over on Mars, yeah. not to be outshined by the cool new kid on the block. Oh, except for it often is. Well, it often is, but yes. But not it here. It has now reached this often kind of sought-after region. It has this new clay mineral outcrops where water once flowed billions with a B years ago. Kind of this crater uh, they're calling uh, Pillinger Point after a principal investigator for the Beagle 2 Mars lander, which is a British Mars lander. They got this new, beautiful photo mosaic captured, kind of peering over the edge. Um, this is a crater that's about 14 miles, 22 kilometers in diameter. Now, for the past couple of months, it's kind of been trekking southwards towards this area, kind of to these kind of aluminum-rich clays. Now, they're kind of in this area. They're kind of going to kind of looking forward to this, do some science here. And their ultimate goal is going even further that's going to have a different type of clay materials, which is really, really interesting stuff that they're kind of hoping to go to. Um, so it's still a couple kilometers away, but they're, they're kind of inching along to more and more interesting things that they're kind of spying on uh, via the uh, Mars Orbit Orbiter. Now... On a note for the awesome little little Opportunity rover, on June 16th, 3,696 Mars days. Wow. It uh, actually kind of 
hit uh, 24 and a half miles traveled on Mars. You got to respect the, that. Yeah, it's that's a long way. It may be since 2004, but... It's way more than I have. <laughs> like a lot more. But longer than you have. Yeah, I've, I, I've, I don't. I think maybe I'm only on a couple miles. In I my see. mind, Heather. In my mind. Oh, in your mind. Let's actually hit the outside of its. Uh, you know, and they have the, where the landing area, and they have this big cir- uh, oval where they draw where it's going to be. You know, landing in this area. It's actually crossed outside of that zone now, so they're kind of excited about that, where they're really outside the frontier. Not quite the same thing, but India's uh, orbiters uh, also hit a milestone, hasn't it? Yes, 100 days and 100 million kilometers not out bad. away from Mars on not June bad. the 16th. That's not bad. They've had, uh, they're getting close to one of their big crucial Mars orbital insertion engine firings. This is one that's going to go out there and study the atmosphere of Mars, kind of look for signals of methane. Uh, this one they're kind of, India's kind of proud of because they developed and designed the whole thing for $69 million. I saw one article where they were kind of joking that they did it for less money than the Hollywood movie Gravity took to make. <laughs> Probably so, true. Is, is it true? It is that like is a, actually true. Wow. Yes. They're like, yes, we sent an actual probe on the way to Mars for less money than it took Hollywood to make a movie. Well, there you they go. kind of did it. Uh, they did do it on the cheap. It took, um, you know, they did it a little bit in a different way so that they could loop around Earth a number of times and kind of right. do a whole bunch of these uh, maneuvers. So they're about 70% of the way on to Mars. Uh, so they're kind of getting there. All their scientific instruments are healthy. They're kind of monitoring it with the Indian Deep Space Network and NASA's kind of also keeping an eye out. Um, Everything's on course. Everything looks good to go. Uh, they're going to be, I uh, think, let's see. I know they're going to get there just 24 to 48 hours after NASA has a new, NASA has a new orbiter um, getting to Mars. And they're going to be kind of doing similar things. NASA's is uh, MAVEN. And they're both going to be looking at Mars's atmosphere and kind of both scientists from both, uh, you know, both teams that are saying, you know, obviously we're going to work together. We're going to kind of collaborate our data and kind of talk to each other about all this. So they've got uh, two more major firings kind of planned, but they're kind of looking forward to getting this. And if they successfully um, arrive at Mars and everything happens good, I think they'll be the fourth country to actually successfully get around and or land on Mars. Hmm. Now, uh, true or false, Heather, you can to, you can or cannot teach an old Delta Five uh, some new tricks. Maybe like since some new tricks since like 1986. You might be able to. You, it, you, can you confirm or deny these rumors? I can confirm and deny it, <laughs> and or okay. deny it. Okay. The ISEE three reboot project. We've been talking about it for weeks. It's this old NASA. Uh, spacecraft. They did a whole bunch of stuff in the 70s and in the 80s, and they kind of retired it. They said, okay, good job, gave it the salute. And then they talked to it again in the 90s and went, that's funny. We thought we turned you off. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't. And so then a, uh, a crowdfunded event went on, and some scientists came together and engineers came together and said, hey, we want to talk to this thing. So they went through and they had special permission from NASA and they've gone through and they've built all the hardware and the software and they talked to the satellite and they actually got the, um, they were able to spin up the satellite to the proper spin rotation. Everything was good. They sent off the first burn because they need to do some course corrections. So it's uh, orbiting closer to the Earth so they can really give some, so they can talk to it a lot better. Okay. So... They fired the first engine, and that went all happy. Okay. Well, they went to do the second one today, the day that air, this show filmed. And they sent, and they didn't see anything. They kind of got partial confirmation that something was happening. Now, there might be that um, one of the systems is low on fuel, or one of the latches isn't quite working. Mm. 
Um, they're looking very closely at the data, looking at the accelerometers, um, talking to NASA, looking at every, a whole bunch of people are obviously staring at this, looking at trajectory data, sending them all, everything they have. So they're kind of putting together a plan. They're going to try again uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, the 9th, and see what happens. And I will definitely keep everyone updated in the weeks to come as to what is happening to this little this little guy. Hopefully, I'm keeping all my fingers crossed that this will be successful and they'll be able to do more science with this. Uh, and, of course, an important update, uh, they have named their mission control McMoons. Yes. McMoons. Yes. Um, this is in a refurbished old McDonald's building, which was located adjacent to uh, the actual facilities right. that kind of got taken over. And so they had their choice of locations and buildings and they kind of just took this decided on this building because they could have it all to themselves mm -hmm. so yes they are in an old refurbished mcdonald's building and now it's mcmoons well heather uh this next button is either going to suck all the oxygen out of the studio in an attempt as, at a new cooling solution or uh -huh. it's a little viewer feedback let's find out oh good oh, okay yeah. I would have been a shy host. I, I was, yeah, I was wondering how I was going to do that. Uh, Rikai's yeah. still working out the kinks. Uh, so we do okay. have a little bit of feedback, don't we? We do on the Twitters. Kenny McLeod sent in pointing out the uh, article, Ocean on Saturn's moon could be as salty as the Dead Sea. <laughs> Indeed, scientists are now analyzing data from the Cassini mission, and they have pretty firm evidence that the ocean inside Saturn's largest moon, Titan, might be as salty as Earth's Dead Sea. Now, this is Saturn's moon, which has coated in ice. And they've looked at it, and they found, yes, there is some sort of liquid, salty ocean underneath it. They've seen cracks, you know, that kind of indicate, yes, something's going on. And they've actually seen plumes of uh, liquid coming out, like liquid volcanoes. And they've been able to see that and analyze it and say, yes, that's salt water. Now, because of the gravity and topography data they have been collecting over the last 10 years of data, uh, yes, uh, Eric Geysers, sorry, thank you. Um, they're taking the gravity and topography data over 10 years and saying, we actually think it might be as salty as the Dead Sea because it would require, that high density of salt would be required for it to explain the gravity data they're seeing. Oh. So this really salty brine water would dissolve, like, um, kind of likely dissolve sulfur, sodium, potassium. And it would give the ocean this salt to, what they can see is then, hmm. it would definitely change the way we see this ocean as a possible, you know, place for life. You know, we've seen it in the past where it's like, hey, there could be an ocean, might we be able to go there, see little squiggly things. Hey, that would be really cool to you know, go down and see if there's something there. If it's this salty, it's kind of changing our views on it. Now we are kind of changing our models. And because of this, um, we're saying, okay, well, maybe the this is indicating that the icy shell is actually very rigid. And the whole thing is in the process of freezing solid. They are seeing that uh, the data is showing that the thickness in the ice crust varies kind of slightly from place to place. Now, this would be better explained if the outer shell is very stiff, which would be the case if the whole thing was slowly crystallizing or turning to ice. So the whole thing is becoming a giant Whoa. ball of ice instead of a ice-covered salty with a little bit of salt ocean. Right. So they're kind of looking at this and saying, all right, well, kind of just deciding they've seen a little bit of methane like 5% methane in what they call, you know, its atmosphere, which is very, very, you know, some sort of gases surrounding the uh, the moon itself. So they're kind of looking at how that might be. You know, there's obviously, if there's methane there, then it's being outgassed somewhere. So they're trying to look at how every how this would be related to everything else. Okay. But... So what you're saying is I'm not going to have space anchovies. I was hoping maybe we'd get out to Saturn to check it out and also pick up some space anchovies from this moon, but it sounds like by the yeah. time we got there, it's going to be all frozen over. Yeah, there might not be space anchovies. Okay. Might be a little too salty for the space anchovies, and 
the time we got there, there you might be having to pick them if there was any space anchovies at all ever might have to pick them out of ice i got a better suggestion it's even easier how about we stop by mars and do a curiosity update let's go and lift off of the atlas five with curiosity how is our favorite rover doing heather all righty well it, our rover's doing pretty good it's little stunt double cousin down here on earth is doing pretty good they're doing some major uh -oh. kind of they're calling it scarecrow they're doing some major uh test driving on it while uh curiosity itself is on its long-term cross-country trip now in Engineers have been kind of really looking over uh, duny areas here on Earth, kind of looking for the best areas to kind of practice driving over kind of conditions that they see coming over the coming up for Curiosity. So kind of scouting out, all right, this is what we see that we're going to have to be getting going through. Let's go around Earth, see what we can find. And then they have a little uh, Mars yard, what they call, and they can sort of set up. Um, a Mars specific yard. condition. <laughs> they can, yeah, they can set up conditions so they can kind of build up, you know, sand in certain ways and hills, and put, you know, build up in just the right way that they want to, so they can kind of test drive it. But itself, in of itself, Curiosity has reached uh, a kind of did a long, tr a little long, uh, eighty-two meter drive and then it stopped it looked like it was slipping too much it kind of automatically is programmed to stop as soon as it senses that it's not making enough progress mm. so that is a successful thing and it uh happened to you know hit a nice little milestone for itself by crossing over a good uh it's landing ellipse so that was good for it now it still has another almost two and a half full little under two and a half, four kilometers to go to reach the uh, the gap that it sees in these dunes to kind of go towards Mount Sharp, the its ultimate goal. And it'll hit sometime later this year. So it's gone about five miles, uh, eight and a half kilometers so far, and uh, over 162,000 images. So it's it's got a cross country trip going on, but it's staying pretty busy with the. Uh, that and the scientists are trying to stay busy here on earth kind of preparing for what is upcoming right i like that they're back here working on it at their uh mars yard that's very good well heather uh, would you do me a favor would you step into the time machine i have a okay. program here we go okay Snorkel, snorkel. It's close. It's close. oh this isn't too bad good yeah. Yeah. all right so uh, i gotta tell you this is actually a used uh, time machine. Some doctors borrowing my regular one, so this is oh, a backup no. one. Yeah. Now but you tell me. It's a good thing though. The trip only takes us to forty nine years ago, July fourteenth, nineteen sixty five. Heather, what happened this week in science? Talking a lot about Mars this week, forty nine years ago, the first close up photo of Mars. The Mariner Four satellite sent a transmission of the first close up photograph of Mars. It consisted of eight point three dots per second of varying degrees of darkness. The transmission itself lasted eight and a half hours, depicted a region known on Mars we call Cenebria, Arcadia, and Amazonia. Uh, so satellite was about 134 million miles away from the Earth. Um, it was a satellite, about 574-pound satellite, launched in November of 1964. So it had a digital tape recorder. It, had, it was able to take about 20 pictures. And it was able to study cosmic dust, solar pl plasma, radiation, cosmic rays, and other such things. But at a mighty 8.3 dots per second, <laughs> in eight and a half hours, we were able to see a little grainy picture, first close-up picture of Mars. Oh, my gosh. That looks... A terrible picture yeah, in eight and a half hours. That's but terrible. First, but Mars' is first uh, close-up. 1965, 49 years ago. Well, and then now we have... Ra now we have... Uh, Rovers over there with reactors and lasers. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's been a it's been a busy forty nine years, uh, which yeah. is good because uh, I used that forty nine years to build the ultimate Cybite two thousand telescope, so that way we could look up into the sky this week. That's right. On Friday, July the eleventh, at dusk, you can see Mars and Spica off to the southwestern sky. Uh, Mars reddish orange. Spica is a giant. 
as a blue-white giant star, so that is a nice combination. And right now, they're just two degrees apart on Friday. One degree is the width of your pinky held at arm's length. On Saturday, you've got the full moon. And also at dusk, now Mars and Spike are even closer at just 1.3 degrees apart. So you'll barely be able to stick your finger, your pinky finger. If you hold it arm's length, it'll barely be able to fit between the two of them. They're really, really close together. Really nice sight over there. In general, this week, the planets, you've got Mercury rising with the sun low in the glow of the sunrise to the lower left of Venus, who is at dawn in the low in the eastern sky. Mars, as we were just saying, is hanging out in the southwest uh, at dusk with Spica. They're getting closer and closer each day throughout this week at their closest point on Sunday, as we previously stated. Poor little Jupiter is kind of lost at sun in the sunset right now. Aww. Yep. But Saturn is hanging out late at the twilight, highest in the sky in the south. There you go. So a lot of planets, with the exception of Jupiter, who is... Just kind of sitting it out this week. Yeah, sitting out, taking a break. Yeah, you know what? Sometimes big guys got to rest. Yep. Uh, there you go. So lots of good stuff. Also, lots of uh, old retro episode links in the show notes. If you want to catch out some select episodes of the SciBite back catalog, Heather has all of those laid out in the show notes as well. Heather, is there anything else we want to cover this week? Not that I can think of. All right, well, very good. I got a couple of things I might mention here. Uh, first things first, since uh, we missed last week's episode and we forgot to give you a heads up, I'll just mention it now. Always safe to check jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar if your favorite show that week didn't show up. You can go over there, and we'd love to have you join us live. Go over to jblive.tv. We do this show on a Tuesday, and you can join us in the chat room and hang out with us. Heather, thanks for the great show. Thank you. No, no, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for tuning this week's episode of SciBike. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, send us in your feedback. You can also tweet Heather, jb underscore mars underscore base on Twitter. Nice and kind of long, actually, Heather. I mean, really. But that's okay. Right. We forgive. It's okay. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of Sidebite. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs> <laughs>